think the opposite extreme that we're looking for is just the, the gamer who plays like every Madden game every go, year. Go ahead and say it. Or the, or go the ahead gamer. And say, it. say the word. The casuals. <laughs> I don't want all the hate mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send the hate mail. Let's today. spread it around. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris are joined again by Nick Kruger to discuss the idea of theoretical versus applied gaming and whether the terms can be useful. Plus, impressions of Starbound, Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition, and Stranger Things. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 74 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, Games and New Media with a Splash of Academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy. And I'm joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we're joined once again by Nick Kruger. Hey, I'm back. Uh, and today we are going to be discussing, uh, well, actually, Doc, uh, how about you uh, go ahead and introduce the topic? Oh, man, I'm not even sure I can, and it's my idea. <laughs> okay, in science, there's this idea that's very well accepted, and it is that you are either an experimental scientist, someone who actually does uh, the practice, if you will, or you are an academic, which means that you are just theoretical, and this is completely fine, and you take jobs based upon this entire framework. Um, It goes out into other fields as well, such as communication, or perhaps um, even design. And that's the question for the day, is does that framework of being an applied gamer also work? Can you be a theoretical gamer and an applied gamer? Is that framework even workable? Is it not? Is it offensive? Um, This should be fun. I'm already offended. I'll say that. (laughs) That's not too incredibly hard. Jim's no. <laughs> ready to be a thought. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually uh, painting my face. I've got like the blue paints. I've got the Woad Warrior look over mm-hmm. here. So, so trigger, wo- warning, uh, <laughs> <laughs> trigger warning. Trigger. <laughs> Don't post this one to our Tumblr. Right. <laughs> uh, before we uh, before we get you triggered, we have some opening segments, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. I've been playing an indie game. Uh, it's a space exploration game called Starbound. Um, it's the game that it's most often compared to is Terraria, or at least that's like the probably the easiest point of comparison. Which is, of course, the 2D Minecraft, basically. So is is this 2D as well? Or not? Yes, it is. It is 2D side-scrolling space exploration game, yeah. very similar graphically. Yeah, very similar graphically to Terraria, um, but no relation development team. Why? No. no. At least I don't think so. There might be, maybe like one of the developers was involved in both games or something. I, I don't think it's. They any- probably played Terraria. Yeah, at least I'm sure they played Terraria. Anyway, um, basically, it's you can describe it as Terraria in space, uh, which I don't think is super fair because uh, Starbound is a good game. It, it's Terraria, but not as Terraria. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> Nice. Um, See, I was, I was about to say that I, I wasn't interested because I'm not never have liked Terraria. Yeah, no, I but now, hate Terraria. Now that I hear that you don't like it, <laughs> but you like Starbound, it yes. makes me think, maybe I yeah, can check it I'm out. Yeah, suddenly I'm interested. I'm right. Actually, actually <laughs> I'm putting my phone away and yeah, pay attention for, for, for reason Nick's about to describe, I think you would actually like it, Doc, because you're the explorer game type. Yeah, yeah. Or gamer type. Yeah, so um, in Terraria... Uh, I'm going to describe the sort of basis of Terraria, and then I'm going to see show you how that how Starbound is different. Uh, Terraria is basically, you know, you set you start out in a Minecraft esque world that's procedurally generated. You do a lot of digging in caves to mine ores, and you use those ores to craft things, and you can build bases and stuff like that. And it's all about exploring, but also doing a lot of building. Um, in Starbound. You start out uh, on a planet like the one in Terraria, where you go through a similar process, um, but very, very quickly, uh, within you know less than an hour, uh, you actually are able to leave the planet and start exploring other planets in the universe. 
Um, and each of those planets has its own set of biomes, its own set of, uh, you know, underground cave systems. It has, you know, structures that have been built on the planet. And, um... See, I thought they were calling that game No Man's Sky. Yeah, I mean, well, I'll, I'll get to that. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the planet generation is very, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting for a long time. Uh, it, you know, as with any procedurally generated game, uh, it will, you'll, you'll start noticing a lot of patterns and you'll start noticing things that like make the planet generation not as special, but for the first 10 or so hours, um, the planet generation is very unique, very interesting because there's different types of planets that have different types of biomes. Really, ten, ten hours. Because I know I'll say this, and this is maybe just from me um, being older, having less time to game. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if a new game can maintain my interest for ten hours, I mean that's that's a win. Absolutely. So it, well, I agree. Yeah, but so one of my favorite things about Starbound is that it actually does a very good job of balancing this procedurally generated content with curated content. So it has a story mode where you complete quests. Part of the missions actually involve you going to just any of the randomly procedurally generated planets and finding uh, structures built by any of the, I think there's like seven races in the game. Uh, So if you find, say, a human settlement, you'll want to start scanning the things that they have there, and that will give you progress towards actually doing a curated content so uh mission uh, where you where okay. you go towards a it's it's like a planet where the lo- the game designers design a level from the ground up and those are the ones on which you can't manipulate the environment right right that's another thing that's kind of weird is that throughout the entire game no matter what planet you go to no matter where you go on any planet you're able to build you're able to destroy things you're able to collect resources whenever you go into one of these missions that has curated content you can't destroy anything and I feel like that's because they they wanted it to not you didn't they didn't want you to break the levels mm-hmm. where you know instead of fighting through this wave of enemies you can just dig through which I would have loved to do because I hate the combat in this. Oh, well, because it also makes it more open ended too. Mm-hmm. Like I, I would design around the fact that people can do that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think that maybe the other argument too is you might want to put like cool things in the levels that you don't want players to sort of like be able to quote unquote cheat by collecting there and bringing back to the main game. Um, I'm not sure exactly like what might be considered that valuable, but like the player's willing to take the time and fill up their inventory doing that. Yeah. Then I don't see why not. But as I was saying, uh, with the uh, procedurally generated planets for the first 10 hours or so, everything is fresh and unique and you, you find, you stop finding things that you've seen before. Um, but what's interesting is that as you progress through the story, you can, uh, you start earning, the tools to start visiting planets that you couldn't visit before. Uh, for instance, there are planets that are highly radioactive, and uh, it's very difficult to survive there. Um, but as you progress through the story, you basically have to go to a radioactive planet to find you know, a, a race that has uh, artifacts that you need to, pr- to go to the next mission. So what you can do is you can build armor and stuff that is radioactive-resistant, And uh, then you'll be able to survive and progress. And that opens up a whole new range of biomes and a whole new range of uh, content to explore. So once you get to the point where, like, oh, yeah, okay, I've pretty much seen everything. But then you can start going to these new planet types. And you've seen something completely different. So there's, like, a mutated biome where the entire world is, like, flat, meaty, uh, gross, like, tentacles and stuff like that. And then there's, like, planets where the entire ocean is acid. And uh, it, it just like there's there's lots of planet types that you don't you can't access at the outset that once you start exploring them later on in the story so it'll it'll stay fresh for a very very long time the exploration is unique and and interesting for a very very long time also one mechanic uh, that also keeps the game having a lot of longevity is the ability to ability to build a colony um, anywhere so you can. Uh, what you can do is you go to this place and you buy a uh, a colony deed, and you can put that in any building that you have to build yourself, and it'll draw a settler to live in the building, and those settlers will pay you rent, and they'll you know maybe even set up shop wherever you build. Um, and as you build a lot of those uh, buildings and add new colony deeds and bring new people in, you start getting missions from them. Um, 
So once you've gotten to the point where you're kind of tired of exploring, you can go and say, oh, I'll just work on my colony for a while. I'll start building a whole lot of buildings. So that'll incentivize you not only to just go explore planets, but also harvest resources from them. So there, there's lots of different, you know, modes of gameplay, so to speak, where not not actual, like, changing modes of the game, but like, okay, I'm just going to explore a planet. I'm just going to see what I can find. And then I'll, there's also, you know, I'll, I'll dig around and I'll find a lot, as many ores as I can. Sometimes you have to go to certain types of planets to get fuel for your, for your sp- spaceship. Um, and then sometimes you just want to progress through the story as quickly as possible. Yeah, I, when I hear games, especially this type of game, you know, that has procedural generated content and tons of exploration, they're like, 100 hours of content. Really, it, these are the sort of games where the amount of content that's there is all up to the player. It's all determined by what they want to seek out and find. If mm-hmm. you are really interested in doing the exploration and building the colonies and doing all those little things that, to me, all feel superfluous because there's not really a goal. Right. It's not gonna. Ha- it's not gonna be a hundred hours. It's gonna be like ten. Right. It depends on the. It depends on the gamer. So again, but if you if you go through the story, eventually the story is gonna send you out to explore, and eventually the story is gonna send you out to build. Yeah, I'm, that, you don't have to spend a lot of time doing it, yeah. but if you end up liking it, you can. So I, I think I think the game does a very good job of balancing the curated content, as in the story, mm-hmm. with all this procedurally generated stuff. So it's not like a game like No Man's Sky. As I was, as I as I said, I would get back to. I haven't played it yet, but from what I've seen, it looks like it's just a lot of exploration and a lot of just doing whatever you want with no real goal. Right. So Starbound has more of a purpose than you think. I think so. Yes, it's definitely better in that sense than say Terraria, and I actually think better than Minecraft because Minecraft doesn't really have much of a goal except what you set for yourself. This is the gaming meta news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. All right, so as some of you know, I used to be a University of Texas at Dallas professor, and as others of you know, I have also uh, gone back to school myself to study Christian cultural apologetics, which is a very, very strange field uh, about... I'm sorry. What? Oh, apolo- ha ha! Low hanging fruit. Low hanging fruit. <laughs> that joke has never been made. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you and Adam, I'm telling you, low hanging fruit. Um, <laughs> so see what I did there? I did, yeah, I did. Oh, Genesis yeah. and oh, yeah. okay. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> there's an organization on campus. It's a it's a student organization that is called Reasonable Faith, and the idea behind it is to bring students in to talk about the idea of apologetics. Their website is actually originsdiscussion.info. But what's interesting is that they've done some neat things in cultural apologetics as well, which is to use uh, more, let's, let's call them primary artifacts in culture, like video games. And so that's where the connection comes in here. And I was given a chance a couple of months ago to go in and talk about God and games. And I actually talked uh, for about an hour and a half, including the Q&A time, about this idea of game designer as a model for God. Hmm. Interesting. And so uh, the idea behind that was that, you know, if God is self-existent, the uncaused causer, supremely intelligent and personal, that actually is a lot like the description of a game designer in the sense that uh, the world is separate from the designer. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we went in and we, we talked a little bit about the four um, sort of arguments, classic arguments for God apologetically. And that's the cosmological, teleological, moral and ontological argument. And if you don't want to get out your Greek dictionary, I will uh, summarize those by saying the argument from creation, design, morality and being. And so um, you can hit my website, adambracken.com. That's Bracken with an I. Uh, and that video is actually up there on my blog and now on my front page, if you scroll down just a little bit, but, um, I, I really want to, uh, start thinking about these new ideas, these new metaphors, these new models and, uh, bridging, you know, the important things that are in my life, which are, you know, gaming and Jesus. So, uh, mm-hmm. I thought I'd take a little bit of my platform here in that order. No. In that, in that, in that, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. You may have come to, come to gaming before I came to Jesus, but that's a whole other story. Um, no, I, I think that uh, we live in a world that is wired up. And the truth is we, we have some postmodern metaphors that work a little bit better than some of the medieval ones that we've been using and stuck to. So um, I would love some feedback from the listeners to watch that video and then post and uh, let me know what you think.
did you are you also i don't know if you talked about about this at all but the way that some game designers have become almost i I, I hesitate to say religious figures but they have Mm -hmm. this sort of devotion from their fan base that almost becomes almost religious. Like well, it's no, very I didn't. Faith based. Um, For example, um, obviously Miyamoto is probably one of the bigger figures. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think you know someone like Kojima is another. Kojima is God is a whole big thing is a whole meme. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. There, there's a lot of little things like that where some of these some of these designers become you know, like so Gavin big in the PC Master Race. Yeah, they're mm-hmm. almost they're almost. I wouldn't say I wouldn't again. I'm not deified exactly, but. Treated as more than celebrities, I'll well, put it that way. I, w- I would say there are a lot of parallels in, yeah. in this. And, and you know, we, we game because there's a need that we have or a desire that we have that's fulfilled by gaming. Mm-hmm. So whenever we look at what that fundamental need is, I think it actually draws us to some of the, the human truths that have existed for a long time. I mean, I could talk about an organization that I happen to know, which is just down the street. Um, people meet there weekly. Um, that you might say they keep that day sort of holy in their in their um, calendars. Mm-hmm. They give a lot of money, probably about ten percent of their income or more, to this organization, uh, and uh, they meet together in smaller groups and, and they study texts. and And uh, you could say that they they really know their history when it comes to their subject matter. I'm of course talking about the game game store yep. um, and the gamers that meet up at Madness Game and, and Comics uh, every week up the and, 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 I'm, and I joke about this but actually kind of one of my long term goals as an apologist is to pose the question what would a gamer church look like what would a geek church look look like if we were to actually look at things like um c.s lewis uh his writings and 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 tolkien that kind of a thing actually use those as sermon illustrations meaningfully um to those who consider that to be their personal heritage that their i mean you know we know the lore of harry potter better than we know abraham and moses so let's make that connection uh, but hit adambracken.com. Uh, you'll see some of my apologetics work, some of my notes from uh, my recent trip to Oxford, and some of the things I've been doing with cultural apologetics. Feel free to reach out to me if you want more. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. All right, so I talked about God. Now let's talk about the dark gods. Mm-hmm. Um, talking, of course, about the new reboot 2.0 version of Mansions of Madness. Now I've got to admit, Mansions of Madness version 1.0, I've played a lot of it. I've probably played uh, about half the scenarios. We've got a good friend who uh, own, owns every single expansion and has run us through most of it campaign style and a lot of it as hacks. Uh, but... There's a fundamental difference between the 2.0 version, which came out last week, and the 1.0 version that's been out for a number of years. Hold on. Before you get too far into it, yeah. could you just explain real quick Mansions of Madness? Oh, well, sure. It, it's essentially a dungeon crawler board game set in the uh, Cthulhu universe, okay. if you will. Um, if you've played Arkham... Eldritch, Ho- Eldritch Horror. Yes. If you've played the Arkham board games, uh, which a lot of people have, uh, then you will understand some of the fundamental mechanics of how the characters interact with the world, but in Instead, imagine it being scenario-driven instead of randomly generated. Mm. Uh, if it puts it into perspective at all, Arkham Horror is absolutely my least favorite board game ever, <laughs> whereas uh, mm. Mansions of Madness ranks up there probably in the top ten. Okay, now what I really want to talk about is the the new innovative thing that has come around with uh, the, the version 2.0. Now, first of all, they've done some really good stuff. They took, uh, like, cards, and they made them into little tokens. They took some tokens, and they made them into cards. And they did it all in a really good way, so there's less stuff on the table. But then they expanded the height of the box and gave you more stuff anyway, which is really cool. That said, you cannot play the game, literally cannot play it, without the companion app. Okay, now let that sink in for a minute. Here we are, you know, we're talking about tabletop um, here on our video game podcast. (laughs) And what we're going with, the direction we're going with in these games, especially from Fantasy Flight, which is literally my favorite um, game company out there, uh, is that a lot of these games that have the dungeon crawl kind of board game element, like Descent, um, the the new version of Doom has been announced as as going to be coming out. Mm. Um, even Imperial Assault, which has been out for a year or two now, has an app that is coming, and it basically it removes the GM element from it, the monster 
um, the monster controller, if you will, the the person who who spends uh, spite tokens or anxiety tokens or whatever that that system uses, and decides, aha, this is what I'm going to do to the players now. This is a problem hmm. because what it now removes is a human interactor making the decisions. And I'm sorry, but we are just not there yet with an, uh, you know, virtual uh, intelligences yet to be able to, to make scary interaction in that way. And it just felt dropped. It felt like there was just some lacking element, human threat element of a guy sitting across the table, uh, you know, furrowing his brows at you and going, I am so going to get you back for what you just did to my monster. Mm. Right. You, you've got a slithering one coming at you next turn. Mm. Mwahaha. Mm. Even if he doesn't do it. One of my favorite scenarios from the first mansions of madness was, uh, just darkness. It was just darkness. And every time you entered a dark room, you had to take some, some mental damage. And the idea was to drive everyone crazy with, why are the lights going on and off? And <laughs> you, there's like one enemy. It's this hellhound that comes out at the very end of the scenario. And it's pretty easy to beat. But if you're crazy at that point, then you lose. And you don't make it to the door. And, 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 and so I, that's the negative part. That's the part that was frustrating me as I was playing this. Here's the great part, the absolutely fantastic part. One, you can take every component you have from Mansions of Madness 1st Edition, and there's a conversion kit which allows you to bring it over into 2nd Edition. Two, if you tell the app, because it asks what sets you have, including all the expansions from the 1st Edition, it will use those tiles, those characters, and those enemies in the scenarios that it creates for the second one. And three, yes, it creates richer, more dynamic, and more interesting, albeit kind of procedurally generated, but not really, mm. um, elements for those scenarios within the context of the scenario. And like Nick just talked about, there's elements of it which are sort of randomized. Just think of it as shuffling a deck and then randomly dealing them out. That's actually a mechanic that's in the first version. Mm. But in this one, um, there's some things that only could really be done um, kind of by the computer because it would be too much on a board game to to try to keep track of. For example, uh, Chris goes over and he tries a shelf, but um, it's stuck and he hurts himself and, and so he takes a wound. Well, Jim's character then tries to go over, uses that shelf too with his strength roll, gets it open. It, it's not that you've got the same difficulty against it. It's that because Chris tried it, he actually made the difficulty lower when Jim tried it. Now, there are definitely ways to do that in a board game place, but letting the computer or the app it's to keep track, keep of. track of it, yeah. it actually just helps a lot. So, I'm jury's also still out. By, um, like ideas like the XCOM board game, I haven't played it, but oh, my yeah. understanding is that that's keeping track of essentially like what the alien forces are up to. Yeah. Like in the background, sort of in real time, if you will, turn by turn. But there's a big difference on that one. <laughs> and it's that it's you versus the board based on the mechanics entirely. Right. Um, this yeah. is trying to simulate a GM element oh, okay. by okay. telling you what the monsters do mm-hmm. and where they go and that sort of a thing. Here's the real rub. There's really nothing that's happening in the fizz rep board space that couldn't also be put into the app. And at that point, all you're doing is playing a video game, mm. a turn-based video game. And it wasn't released that way on purpose because they want you to spend the 100 bucks on the board game. So, like I said, the jury's still out. I'm going to play a couple more scenarios and report back in a few weeks because I, I want to love it. But my first experience with it, um, I kind of phoned it in just a little bit on the scenario itself, and I realized that was a bad decision. Because even though you could do that in the first edition, you can't in the second one. You have to pay very close uh, attention to what you're doing. And if you smash that urn without checking the the notation first and and looking at the painting and figuring out that you can go scatter the ashes, the ghost is going to haunt you and it'll come back, and it's pretty intricate. Hmm. Um, But at the same time, it feels so scripted. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll see we'll see what happens after we get into some more difficult and interesting scenarios I know one of them is supposed to take about six hours if you play it through entirely because it has multiple locations believe it or not we're not always playing games every now and then we like to talk about the other stuff speaking (laughs) of um, Eldritch Horror actually it's a little related um 
Doc and I have uh, watched uh, Stranger Things on Netflix. I know a lot of people have watched it. Um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about it, uh, not to spoil too much for uh, Chris and Nick over here. You nailed that connection. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I didn't make that connection until the last episode. And I don't want to spoil the, the, the yeah. ending. So, well, spoiler alert, there we're going to be some details here, but we promise we won't give away the ending. Yeah, and one thing I do want to say is that even though I do think there's some influence from the Cthulhu mythos, I do think that the closest connection is really more of a marriage between... Um, 80s Steven Spielberg uh-huh. and Stephen King. And I, I think it's, see that. it's very, very heavily influenced by the Stephen King connection and hit the way that he approaches Supernatural, which, by the way, was also influenced um, by Lovecraft. By Lovecraft, of course. So, But I do think that it shares more in common with King than it does with Lovecraft, except for when it comes to the monsters. The, True. The design itself. It sounds True. like we should have called it uh, Stephen Things. Yeah. <laughs> well, and when I say Steven Spielberg, I mean specifically, there are actually direct references to multiple Steven Spielberg movies. Oh, there movies, are, yeah. Uh, na- from the 80s, namely E.T. and the Goonies are mm-hmm. the two big ones. Well, and, and actually some of the framing and visuals were specifically set up to remind us visually of those things, like kids riding bikes and the moon well, the, and various the, um, setups. What was it called? The, the, the Department of Energy building? Yes. Yeah, yeah it was the way it was lit in one of the first scenes that is introduced is almost a shot-for-shot direct copy of, of an early shot of a military base in E.T. Yes. So they, they, he, they do this very intentionally to evoke, because we've all seen these movies, this this uh, series takes place in 1983. Mm-hmm. So it's trying to evoke this sense of the, of the 80s, not just in um, the set design, the costumes, which, by the way, it, it's brilliantly done. The dialogue. Everything, everything in the dialogue as well. Everything is... is Perfectly set up to make it feel like it is taking place in 1983. Yes. But also they evoke the nostalgia with references to um, movies that took place also in a similar time frame. Mm -hmm. And not just direct references of, um, oh, you see, you know, a poster of, of... Evil Dead on the wall of one of the uh, one of the characters. Right. Not just that sort of reference, but also these shot references where you go, oh, I can't quite remember where I what movie I saw that in, but you know you've seen it somewhere, uh-huh. so it just feels it's evocative. Yeah, in the right way. Yeah, and I got to say, the kids that they found to act are fantastic. They are brilliant actors. Yeah, and I usually hate kid actors. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not a huge fan of child actors. I, I usually can't stand them, yeah. but. I was very impressed, especially, and, oh, I don't, I feel, I feel bad. I'm going to look her name up so that we can put it in there. But the, the, the girl actor, the one who has, eleven, this, yeah, 11, yeah. um, she was really good. Well, they all were. Um, I, I can't think of a, of a single actor in there who wasn't, um, you know, and, 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 and you can look at it a couple of ways. You, you Millie, can, I got her name, Millie Brown. Millie Brown. That's right. Yeah. Um, you, you know, first of all, the She's writing, excellent. the writing was spot on. Um, I, I think uh, before the show, you, you made a comment like uh, they treated it like an eight-hour movie. Yes. Which it was. It absolutely felt like a miniseries to me uh, in that regard. Um, but the, the, the writing was wonderful. The, the characters were round. The sort of the, the learning curve in terms of what the audience learns and when they learn it along with the three, the sort of three main character plots, if you will. Yes. It's all centered around the same thing. A boy goes... You know, and is missing. I mean, that's that's the hook for the whole show. And, and the way that they they weave them together, yes. and like make you make you anticipate them come because you, you know those arcs are going to come together at some uh-huh. point. The way they make you anticipate that, yes. I think, is really clever. I agree. I completely agree with that. Um, but the introducing the, of the characters, for example, the the cop. What was his name? Uh, uh, Colin or Calvin or Calvin or something. Hopper. Hopper. Hop- Hopper. Right? <laughs> yeah, that was, I was almost there. Uh, I was practically there. Uh, no, you threw me off for a while. I thought, I thought like, <laughs> no, you're right. Hopper. Hopper. <laughs> uh, the, the way they introduced that character, um, his, oh, his like his first line uh, is, is something like, um, "Mondays are for coffee and contemplation, Karen." Coffee and contemplation. Yeah. You just, you, you're set up with the idea of, okay, I'm going to hate this guy. Yeah. He, what oh, a yeah. jerk. Oh, he's the antagonist. I'm going to, you know, and whatever. He, he doesn't want to deal with, with, um, you know, Joyce. With the kidnapping and, and the kidnapping. Oh, and, yeah. The mother. And you're like, what a, what a jerk. Yeah. And then, punch him in the face. Right. But there's so much to that character that you, what you get to like, like see what he's oh, gone through. Oh, the backstory. Yeah. And you realize it. Um, and, and then there's this, this really great line later uh, where he says, am I cursed? 
mm-hmm. and and he's talking to his wife, and he's he's basically talking about how there hasn't been uh, a missing child since what, like the thirties, yeah, and there hasn't been a suicide since the sixties, and both of those things have happened in like one day for him in the last mm-hmm. twenty four hours, and it's just it's such a rich world. I feel like that town um, was was real. Like I could just go there. In fact, so much so that I looked it up. I wanted to find out where where the whole thing was filmed. Town of uh, Hawkins, right? Yeah, Hawkins, uh, Indiana. Hmm. It's Atlanta, Georgia, in and around Atlanta. Really? Uh huh. It really is. Like they used various suburbs, but it, it, it's funny because if you hit some of the uh, the Hollywood tours websites, they are already setting up tours now of Hawkins, Indiana, in wow. Atlanta, Georgia. Well, let me ask you this. Um, Doc, going all the way through the series, and we're not going to spoil specifics of the last episode. The butler did it. Um, oh, dang it. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, but what did you think about... They sort of saved some of these specific... And they hinted at the backstory of um, Hopper throughout yeah, yeah. the show. But in the last episode, they really give you... Okay, here's here's exactly what happened. Like mm-hmm. They do through flashbacks, and they're triggered flashbacks. Yeah. Um, tri- things that trigger it based on what's actually happening in the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, I was watching it, and honestly, it was actually kind of hard to watch at times because yeah. it was so powerful. It was powerful. Um, but what do you feel about them waiting until the last episode to do it? Because I, th- I think that's why it was powerful. Yeah, um, I think so too. Had they done it any earlier, uh, I think they would have been trying to shove it down our throats. See what I did there? You yes. see? Do you get, yeah, do you get I what I, I did? They'll, they'll get it when they watch yeah, it. Yeah, they will. <laughs> Let me guess. Something gets shoved down somebody's throat. I have no idea what you're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, no, I, I think that, that, that the intensity of the emotion yeah. um, in that moment was transferred to us, the audience, mm-hmm. through, through the character. throat. Yeah. <laughs> through the character of Harper. Har- Har- but I think, but I think you get this. Who hops into your throat. Right. No, but I think you get this. this it was hard to swallow yeah. either way. But uh, there's this tension of the last the last part of the uh, uh, last episode. Yes, there is. There's this real tension and, and, and sense of dread. What's going on? Again, yeah. we're not going to reveal anything. But... The flashbacks, it's there's this other sort of tension. Yeah, there is very different sort of tension because right. it's because it's, it's an emotional type, and it's a revealing sense. of the backstory of the characters yes. that allows us that. And and I think had it been like, oh look, um, it's this damaged character of this cop, and he's got this backstory, and and six episodes later we'll have the payoff. No. No, we would have forgotten about it by then. Even though we're binging this thing and watching it all in one night, which everybody does when they start yeah. watching. Don't start watching this at 9 p.m. You will be up in the morning. Shoving uh, it all down your own throat. Yeah, all at once. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> uh, but what, what, what you get instead is he seems like a, an undamaged character. He seems like a reliable character. He seems like a good character. And you can empathize with him as a character, especially when he, when he really starts to kind of break the rules and he's yeah. like, oh, breaks the rules. Cause he's got, you know, and then we're like, yeah, you do that. And, 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 <laughs> and it's like, um, at the end there, when he starts having the flashbacks to his own life, we were keyed in at the moment we need to be for the emotional intensity of it. If we'd seen it earlier and we were having our own flashbacks to what we'd seen earlier, it wouldn't have been as powerful. And there's this moment in, in the last episode, I, about halfway through the last episode, halfway. I guess, it becomes, well, like the, the denama. It's of, falling of, action. Yeah. Of the, of this, of the entire series. Frankly, the, the climax is yes. over and it's all falling action and resolution. And there's this huge, like, sigh of relief. Like, you feel it's, it's handled just like a movie, like, very perfectly where yeah. the rest of it is, okay, you've gone through this incredibly tense experience mm-hmm. and now you're just sort of taking it in and seeing, seeing the epilogue and everything else that, that builds up and leads to potentially a second season. And Lord of the Rings the same sequel. thing. <laughs> yeah. So, before before we move on, I did want to mention because we are a gaming show. Yeah, the the strong connection to Dungeons and Dragons oh, within yes. the series. In fact, one of the early creators of uh, the, the guy who wrote the Red Box, the original Red Box, has actually offered to bring the actors um, in to play an original scenario uh, of the the Red Box D and D because he wagers that they've not actually played it. And he wants to remedy this before season two. He's probably right. Uh huh. Um, but I thought it was it was pretty neat to see these you know these kids. Which, if I remember, I think the series 
almost started with them playing. It did D&D. start with it. That's the opening scene. Really. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, the, they're about to be attacked by the Gorgomon or whatever. The Demo, Demo, Dem- Demogorgon. 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 Yeah, that's Demogorgon. It. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Demogorgon. That's Which it. becomes their nickname for the monster. Right. Throughout that's exactly throughout right. The series as well. Which I think is a clever name, by the way. I don't know if that's a reference to actual Red D, uh, Redbox D and D or not. Um, but but it's like a, a Gorgon and a demon. All mm-hmm. Demogorgon. Anyway, I thought the same thing. I was I wasn't sure if that was an actual yeah. monster or not. So uh, maybe we need to look that up and be informed. But uh, regardless, it doesn't matter because uh, Stranger Things. If you are a Gen Xer, uh, you have to. You are compelled to watch the show. As mm-hmm. far as I'm concerned, um, if you are of a younger generation, you want to understand your parents. They can <laughs> watch shove, Stranger well, Things. They, they can shove it down our throats. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> seriously, please. No, if, I, I, I would <laughs> say. I would say even if you're if okay. you're not of you know, that generation, it also has this. Um, if you like supernatural mystery shows like this is sort of very much in the vein of x-files it's just a darn good story right so if you like yeah and it's also a great story too but if you love mystery with supernatural elements to it um you will like this show mm-hmm. absolutely and now this week's meaty topic of discussion So in the intro, I talked about this idea of applied versus theoretical. And I thought this was brilliant. So brilliant, in fact, that I decided to ask uh, one of the more well-known communities out there in board gaming world. It's the board game group on Facebook. Mm. Uh, It's got a couple thousand members. And so I put it out for them. And I said, "Um, guys, given... That in the world of science, there's two types of scientists. An applied scientist who, who does the applied work in his field, uh, and the theoretical scientist who does, you know, math on the chalkboard, if you will. Um, which of those types of gamers would you consider yourself to be? Would you be an applied gamer or would you be a theoretical gamer? And I immediately got the vitriol of the internet <laughs> thrown back at me. Uh, big flame war. Well, which it's, was, it's, it's worth noting that you're in a Facebook group. <laughs> well, that's true. That's much more prone to flame wars. But, but if, it's... If you were posting it on Twitter, it would have been even worse. Oh, yeah. Or Reddit. That would have been totally safe. 4chan. Uh, okay. Post it on 4chan. Ah, oh, there you go. That I feel like I feel like at least part of their reaction is feeling to understand what you meant. Yes. Quite yeah. possible. Because they hear theoretical and they think that, like, they don't actually do anything. Right. And they think that, like, you're just calling them a casual, basically. Well, and, and I think... That, that's what I think happens, I think too. That's, that's one of the interesting ideas behind this whole thing is that, actually, that's a valid um, criticism, mm-hmm. <laughs> especially board gamers and board game collectors. Because the ability to play your board games, if you have a large collection, sometimes can outweigh or, or not quite be as uh, enthusiastic, shall we say, as your ability to go to Kickstarter and buy a new game that comes, you know, six months later, you'll have... Basically, you've got a stream of games coming in every week. Well, and that's the collector element, and people do that with video games as mm-hmm. well, especially um, older games. There's people that literally just collect them and don't play them. Right. So I think that's a different... I wouldn't... That's not even, like, a type of gamer. That's just that's just a collector. That's a different Oh, they would thing, agree with... They would disagree with you so incredibly hard on that Well, one. unless they're playing it, they're not gaming. Buying it is not gaming. Okay. So Sorry, that, guys. you got to open that box, put it down, set it up, and play. Oh, Please, they read the rules. They just don't have any friends. Send, send oh. hate mail. Send hate mail to Jim Weaver right over here. Thank you. <laughs> right after Jim Doc at said. <laughs> oh, 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 dear. And I gave, my, I gave my website earlier, didn't I? <laughs> um, no, what, what I'm really saying here is, is this. Whenever you want to be a designer and you want to teach theory or work in the field of design, that kind of a thing, is it a foregone conclusion that you must also play games? Well, And if so, I would like to point out that that is a reversal on just about every other field. Mm. For example, if you wanted to um, be a uh, professor in math, that's totally normal. Even if you've never had a math-geared career where you worked in the industry and created something. Right, but you're talking about a couple couple points I want to make here. One, you're talking about like the sciences versus a creative field. 
The arts. And then, yes, the arts. Okay. And then the, the second distinction I'd like to make, you talked about if you wanted to be a designer or be a professor, teach it academic. Mm -hmm. I think those are very different things. I think if you are someone that wants to study games, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily, that's not necessarily the same person that is actually designing and creating games. It's also so, not the same thing. They could the be, they could be the same person. It's also not the same thing as the person who's teaching you how to make the game. Yes. You can also have, I think, theoretical gamers who study games and mm -hmm. maybe write about games. Um, and then like there's playing of the games, but there's also, I think a difference between theoretical design and, the and applied design. Yes. If that makes sense. Well, let me give you a real world exactly. example. Here. I agree. Um, 2012, I went to a conference. It was a gaming conference in Oxford, and the format of the thing was that you actually sat down with everyone else who was going to be presenting. Mm -hmm. So there's no audience except for also other speakers. It was a three-day thing. Everybody got 20 minutes to talk, and then there was a 30-minute Q&A and panel of three. It was brilliant. Everybody was listening to everybody. It was the best audience I've ever had, ever. I learned more in that conference and, and the following conferences from the same group than probably any other conference ever, ever, ever. And I've been to a lot of them. Mm. That said, I was one of maybe four or five actual gamers in the sense of I sit down and I play video games. I, I love playing video games. I clock 20 hours a week playing video games. And most of them were game academics studying games and video game theory or game design theory at various universities throughout the world and not playing them. See, and I have a problem with that, and I'll, I'll explain why. I understand you can get away with that to an extent in some other um, in some other artistic fields, mm -hmm. but because games are interactive, if you really want to understand gaming, you have to play games. Just, it, it's like someone being a film critic studying film being a professor of film but never having watched but them. never watching oh great example great connection maybe uh maybe reading the screenplays or something like that right and a film mm -hmm. film or, or reading about people's reactions to it and you studying, only read the critics right or or <laughs> studying the 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 social aspects of people that are film buffs of a certain genre like it's say the say say, tre say trekkies but you never but then never watching star trek right you're you're missing that connection there and i think that that is something that goes on in in game academia where they do want to study gamers and the culture that surrounds gaming and yet don't want to actually get into that culture themselves and experience the games and even experience the online uh, online gaming experience, which of course lends itself to a lot of um, some of this, you know, vitriol, anger, that kind of thing that comes into it. I don't even play online games anymore because of just because of that sort yeah. of aspect. I think it. it's, I think it's possible though to study the culture, uh, especially certain subcultures of gamers uh, while remaining outside in order to remain objective. Um, but if you're talking about the games themselves, yeah. And the design now, and yeah, I think, I think that's, that's fair to an extent. I, I do think that if you really want to understand the people that you're studying, mm. you should at least have some experience gaming. Just like how, if you really want to understand, um, you know, because the, there's been a lot of people that I, I keep going back to Trekkies because they've been actually studied specifically mm -hmm. just because of how, you know, intensely faithful that the fan base is. Um, if you want to study that fan base and yet you've never seen any, anything related to Star Trek and have no idea really about Star Trek except for theoretically, you're not really going to have, you're not really going to make that same sort of connection or really understand what's drawing people to it. Mm hmm but gaming, is the, I really do feel it's even more important because it is an interactive medium. Well, so you bring up a really interesting kind of point, which is that um, you don't have to study games in order to play them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, wh why? I mean, it, I, I guess I could I just easily uh, say I was going to um, challenge someone to read... Uh, Lord of the Rings, or uh, you know, one, one of the mini pastiches, uh, you know, choose your fantasy mm -hmm. series. Mm -hmm. uh, but before you do that, you need to do an exhaustive study of uh, the fantasy genre, what's been written about it, and everything before you can actually read that primary source. Um, people look at you like you were nuts. That that's not the way we do that, right? Um, so, you know, in that same sense, if you're looking at the artifact of the art itself versus what's been written about that um, and the study of that, it's kind of a different world or field. But in gaming specifically, um, you've got gaming academics who don't 
play games, is playing games, this is where I'm going with all this, is playing games an act of creation? Well, look. The let's, Smithsonian said it was, me, by the way. And, I, and I, can, I can actually see that. But before we quite get there, let me just make this one point sure. about... Liter- literature majors. Look at literature for for example. Mm-hmm. Let's say that your focus is um, like Tolkien is a good example. Yeah. Um, you're not going to go. You're not going to go in and study Tolkien or Tolkien uh, based fantasy without actually reading Tolkien. One would assume. So if you're going to study games or specific types of games or talk about design of specific games mm-hmm. and you're not actually playing those games, then I'm sorry, you're naive and you you are what you're contributing is. In my opinion, I don't think it's useful. It's derivative at best. Yes. Because what you're doing is you're basing your opinion of a game on what other people frame about that game. Is there anything to be said for watching somebody play a game like Let's Plays? No. And the reason why, I I think that you can get some experience there. And what you're really getting is, it's it's still secondhand. You're getting the experience of, oh, this is how this person reacts to this game. Mm -hmm. But because games are an interactive medium, if you want to experience it, like you have to actually play it yourself. Let me, let me give you an example with film. Um, a, let's, a let's play of a game is similar to having me um, sit down and tell you about, say, the new Suicide Squad film. If I sit down and I explain it beat for beat how, how the film is, I haven't seen it, so I can't do that. Yeah. But let's say that I have seen it, and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to explain beat for beat the film. And you will have a pretty decent understanding of that film. Mm-hmm. But you haven't seen the film. Yeah, but I feel like with with film, a big part of it is the visual medium. Yes, you have to see the film. Yes, and in games, but, but in games, interactivity not, yeah. is the same thing. But also, you have a lot of the. I mean, obviously, you're missing the interactivity, but you're seeing somebody else interact with it, and you're seeing all the visual stuff that but happens in a game, but, but, and you're seeing all the audio, and you're seeing all the story. Right, but and what's the okay? Mechanics. So if I if I hand you a the script of Suicide Squad, and you read that script. Mm-hmm. Is, is that, and I give you a, the storyboards of Suicide Squad because they have them and I sit them in front of you yep. and I give you the soundtrack of Suicide Squad and I give it to you and you, you watch all of this you, you look at all the storyboards you read the script you listen to the soundtrack have you experienced the movie? No. no. And the same thing with the Let's Play experience here you might be getting parts of that experience mm-hmm. but the interactivity is, is, that is that is the experience of gaming that is unique to games. And I would yes, argue that... Yes, but I that... feel like you can at least experience a, 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 enough to... Like, if you have experience with other games, you can... Ex- We're talking about people that don't. True. For starters. But, yeah, but if you've played games and, and you know in general, you can watch a, somebody play a game and get a general sense of what it's I'm like. I'm going to take up for Nick on this one, because as a professor who taught games, mm-hmm. taught game design, there were many times when I needed an example of a game... I had not played, and I was able to pull it on uh, YouTube and be like, check this game out, let me show you this, we're going to talk about and, this element. And, 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 and that I agree with, but that's because you have the background. Yeah, you, have right. the, you have the background un- knowledge, and I, and I can do that too, and I can do that, by the way, I can do that with movies because I've in certain genres because I've seen so many of them, yeah. that if you're explaining to me about a certain type of movie, I might be able to have a good understanding of that experience. It's not going to be quite the same as right. watching the movie, just like it's not going to be quite the same as playing the game, but... Yes, but that's because I have background knowledge, and that's because you have background knowledge. We're talking about people that are not playing games at all, that are looking, or, or maybe they've played like a couple of games. They're not they're lifestyle not, gamers. They're not right. really gamers, so yeah. they're not going to have that that ample um, background knowledge to pull from when they see this. To get Because people that are watching Let's Plays are gamers. Yeah. They're people that understand games. They're people that, that they get a good sense of what that game is by watching the Let's Play because they have so much knowledge of games. Right, because I've played, you know, for instance, I've played a lot of Legend of Zelda games. Right. And when I was watching the footage from E3 of the, the new Zelda game that's coming out, I was able to glean pretty much everything I needed yes. to know about the gameplay from, just from watching. Yes, and, and that's because you, know, you're, you are someone that plays games. You're a gamer, mm-hmm. so you, you understand that. But if you had... Um, imagine that you're someone that doesn't play games. Are you? You've only played like a couple of games, maybe on your phone. Like you've played around with a few games. You're just not a gamer, and you were to watch that same footage, your impression of it and your experience with that would be so different. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or even if you're kind of going again on like what people are saying about the game, and not even watching a let's play. Um, 
you know, for instance, if you were to hear something about this film, you know, and you're, you're trying to sort of make a judgment about the film, you know, if you have the background where you know the director, you know the actors, you know, like, the genre that it's in, mm-hmm. all this different stuff can kind of lead you to hear something and be like, okay, I can imagine what this film's like and kind of make some, you know, maybe not, like, the best judgment about it because you haven't seen right. it, but you can make a judgment about it. Well, and we have trailers, um, too. And, yeah. I mean, if you, if you understand the genre well enough mm-hmm. and then you see a trailer... Um, if you watch a lot of movies like I have, you usually can kind of tell how the movie's going to At be. For example, like Suicide, Suicide Squad, like right. what you mentioned, I don't yeah. think that's going to be a very good movie based on everything I've heard about it. Yeah. Um, you can decide whether or not to spend the seven fifty. in other words. Right, but, exactly. if you, but if you were not someone that watches movies, mm-hmm. if you were just the person that, oh, yeah, I've seen a couple of movies, and you would not have this, you would not be able to do that reliably. Right. And then you could say, not as an academic. And then you can make an argument yeah, right. too that, you know, you're making a judgment about whether or not to spend the seven fifty for yourself. Does that give you the right to share your opinion? Like you can even say like I'm not seeing this because of this, this and this. Right. But you can't really make a judgment about the film and say the film is bad because X, Y, and Z. Oh no, you need to, I feel like it's going to be bad. You need to X, log onto the internet afterwards yeah. and find out what your opinion is. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. So that you can um, either like it or uh, But this, right. this leads me into like kind of a point to kind of continue this discussion maybe in a slightly different direction is I think in order to be able to decide whether you're an applied or a theoretical gamer and let's, let's stick to gamer as opposed to game designer because the discipline of making games is very different from the discipline of playing in or talking about games. Okay. But I feel Um, like you need to have experience in both fields to make a game. So maybe that is more than you think. Well, let's, let's focus on like kind of what, like let's assume our audience aren't game designers. Mm -hmm. Let's assume our audience is gamers. And so let's we talk apologize about it. to the game designers. Yeah. Group. We know that there are game designers out there, but like just for the sake of this discussion, let's focus on yeah. right. Ken Levine, who is a loyal listener. Yeah. Uh, we're not talking about you. Yeah, and uh, Hideo and, Kojima and, is listening to us right and, now. And, right. Yeah, and everyone else who we've established are loyal listeners <laughs> right. to the podcast. Yes. Um, Uncle Fergus. <laughs> um, but I feel like in order to distinguish yourself as either applied or theoretical, you first have to have received some sort of training, um, as yeah. opposed to someone who could be like you know like. You could you could say that I am a film buff without having studied film. Mm-hmm. You know, I can I can go and I can experience a lot of films. I can do a lot of reading. I can experience a lot of art in general, whatever the case might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if we're not talking art, we're talking sciences. I can understand things about some science and about some math and stuff like that just from my my basic training. You know, like my school. Um, but there's there's a point at which like you have to have had some sort of formalized training. I think even like in the sciences before you can say I'm an applied or I'm a theoretical well, scientist. Right. You've received formal training. I, and here's where I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I. When it comes to the sciences, when it comes to mathematics, you do need that formalized study. But mm-hmm. I actually do believe that when it comes to um, the arts, I don't think you do. I think that you can, in a sense, sort of like teach yourself mm-hmm. by having enough experience, either when it comes to games, for example. I, there are a lot of game designers. Um, I would say, I would, I would hazard to guess that the vast majority of people that are designing games, that are game designers have not formally studied games. And I'm, I'm willing to give you, like, we'll, we'll see that self-training counts as training for this purpose. Right. And so um, and that, that's kind of what I'm getting yeah, at. Yeah. So it's not formalized in the sense mm-hmm. that I don't think that... You don't you need have, to go to design school to be a good sure, game designer. Right. But, right. but if, you're, if you're going to be an engineer, if you're going to be a, you know, a, a chemist... You're going to go to school. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, they're, I'm, they're I'm probably, pointing out the difference. Yeah, you can figure it out. Yes. There are probably <laughs> stories of someone right. who has figured of, things out on their own. That's well, not the point. Of course, he's of course. <laughs> right. No, obviously there is. But my point is that it's much more common yeah. when it comes yeah. in the arts. You can do it. And of course, I'm not, I'm not saying that you can't have the formal education element to it. That's not what I'm saying either. I'm just saying that I, I, wouldn't, cons- I wouldn't say that it has the same sort of like you, you, bas- you practically have to have it in the sciences, mm-hmm. whereas in the arts you can have it, mm-hmm. but there's also that element of, of personal study yeah. that is a much more common in the arts. I'm going to pull in my education background here and, and my MED just for a mm-hmm. moment and say that there is a guy named Joseph Renzulli who has a model for uh, what he calls gifted behavior. Mm. And it is a triple Venn diagram. And it says that this occurs, it emerges as a behavior whenever you combine three things, above average ability, creativity, and task commitment. And it's interesting that those three things are together because what he's saying is it's not just about how smart you are. It's also about how sort of naturally creative you are. But you can be both of those things. And if you don't give a care and you don't put your mind to it and actually produce, 
it's not going to be emergent as a behavior. So I think that if we're talking about sort of the, the naturally gifted game designers out there, which are out there, fantastic tools are available to, to create and do, and uh, that sort of thing. Sort of like the Metroid game that we talked about. Um, no, and I, I, agree, you know, I agree with that, what you just said. I completely agree with that, yes. And you have to have that dedication. I'm just saying that you can, you can be dedicated and sort of teach yourself in certain ways mm-hmm. from the experience of the arts, as opposed to with science, you can't read a bunch of equations and now you understand sure. high-level math. And, and I would say that there are some exceptions, like the technical ability to yes. uh, create something or mm-hmm. use the tool. Even a painter needs to understand color right. theory. But <laughs> You're uh, right, there are. With, you know, within the context of gaming specifically, be that board gaming or video gaming mm-hmm. or you know, role-playing or anything and, like and that. If I may, I, I'd like to share kind of a personal example of where I think you might be going with Okay, this. cool. The difference between theoretical and applied. Right. Um, I, as part of my RPG design... I study a lot of RPGs. Yeah. I own so many RPGs. Mm-hmm. I've played maybe a tenth of them. Okay, yeah. So that makes sense. I, I, I am an applied gamer. I do role-playing games. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I've, I think I've done, in a lot of ways, I think I'm more theoretical as a role-playing game player. Um, because I've done so much studying of RPGs and of the of the culture surrounding RPGs and all this different stuff, mm-hmm. thinking about RPGs and thinking about design, more so than I've done a lot of playing. Yeah, like uh, D and D is a good example. Like you know, I can sort of I can understand what people are talking about when they talk about D and D, and I can relate to people who play D and D. But I've not played enough D and D to really call myself a D and D player. Right. I've played a lot of other RPGs. I've read D and D. I've you, studied, you've played some GMD. Yeah. I've played a little bit, but I mean, like, not really, truly. You yeah, know? yeah. When we've played D and D, it's, it's, always, it's always like, oh, now. let's just screw some of the rules because yeah. we but, have But fun. if you're like me, uh, then I would guess you would also prefer to play the D and D board game than you would to play D and D just the standard because D and D, especially like fourth ed mm-hmm. kind of a thing, is basically a board game yeah. anyway. But taken and in, it, taken in a Dungeons and Dragons vacuum, yes. Um, yeah, I'd rather play so many other games than the D and D board game. Right, but right, <laughs> but but. The that's what I was using as an example. Sure. Whereas in the role playing space, I would guess you probably have an entire column, maybe folder of uh, role playing games that you would consider uh, crunchy games not worth playing that are outside of my my uh, that are not to my taste. To you, yes. right? That, that's what I meant personally. But that I still understand on a theoretical level. Absolutely, I, I've read the rules. I know the systems. I understand how they're basically supposed to function. I understand where you can and can't bend the rules depending on the style of your group mm-hmm. and of your GMing style. Um, but I've not really played a lot of those games. I think with 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 RPGs uh, specifically, because it requires you, you can't just sit down and play by yourself. Not really. You kind of have, and also there's a very big time commitment there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like, like, if I want to understand Super Mario Brothers, if I've never played it, I don't necessarily have to beat Super Mario Brothers. Even if I do, it's not going to take me that long to beat it. But mm-hmm. let's say that I want to really understand Super Mario Brothers. I can sit down and I can play for, like, you know, an hour or so, and probably a lot less. But let's say it's my first time. If I play for, like, an hour, I'm going to have a really good understanding mm-hmm. of what the game is about. Mm-hmm. A really good... If, even if I've never played a platformer before. Even if you never read about it either. Yes. Um, but if we're talking about an RPG, mm-hmm. I, it, there's, there's so much more that you have to do there. But one of the reasons why you're able to, to go through and read these rules and get a good understanding of them is because you also have a background mm-hmm. in yeah. playing RPGs. The, the training. Right. That we established. Yeah. And, and, and so, But if you didn't have that background, if you were literally just trying to understand RPGs and trying to study RPGs, doing nothing but reading RPGs, mm-hmm. you would only be able to go so far, I think. Yeah. I mean, that's my personal... I would agree with that. Yeah. And so that's why I, I, I really do have a problem mm-hmm. with the game gaming academics or ga- gamer, gamer academics, gaming academics, video game academics, who don't play games. Yeah. And now I would say, though, that, like, you know, again, this is kind of going back to our original point where why the flame I should say never on. play games. I should right. I never have played games, I should say. Because they're, they're, if if they used to play a lot of games and now they don't, right. that's a little different. It I'm ranks talking- right up there with the news reporters cracking down on GTA and how evil and bad it is mm-hmm. and haven't played it. Right. Or, I, I agree. I or agree. somebody who's like, um, Harry Potter is evil and it's about witches and hasn't read it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, if I you're think gonna, so, doesn't even really know the concept because, like, if you even know just anything about Harry Potter, you're not going to find that right. evil witchcraft or anything. Yeah, I mean, you don't even have to read it to understand. I mean, that. It's completely uh, messianic when you get to the the final book. It's, it's true. Yeah. I mean, it's straight up messianic. I've watched enough movies to know that if it's British, they're probably evil. 
<laughs> oh, right. <laughs> That's American films for British people in them. But this is kind of going back to, I think, the reason why, Doc, you had this this uh, virulent reaction when you tried sharing this idea yeah. is because, and this is the reason I share my example, the difference between like trying to distinguish what we mean exactly by theoretical gamer versus mm-hmm. applied gamer. Yeah. It's not that oh, you're theoretically a gamer because you say you are. Right? <laughs> theoretical <laughs> means like it's, it's theory as in like understanding and like having a system for something. It's right. something that has been tested and, you know, verified. You have an almost encyclopedic knowledge yeah. without any kind of um, experience mm-hmm. actually playing the games you mm-hmm. wish you could and or otherwise. To contrast that, I would say that the, the extreme other end, the extreme applied gamer, is someone who is, say, a pro gamer who makes their living playing a specific game or a specific set of games. Mm-hmm. And, see, and see, that right there is where I'm going to have to disagree. Mm. Um, I think it's more the person, the extreme game hobbyist that is playing games, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of hours of gaming a week as a hobby. Mm. Um, because I think when you start to get into the, the professional space where you're being paid to play a specific game or a, a small subset of games, like which Twitch streamers. do, well, okay, well, it this, depends on which this, one. I, 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 I almost feel like, but, but I think, well, well yeah. but um, the point that I'm the yeah. point that I'm making is that that it's a little bit it's different when you're playing a game because you are paid to play it and you're specifically trying to get good at this game so that you can win in professional tournaments mm-hmm. versus. So you're an athlete at that point. Yeah, you're essentially you're essentially an, an athlete or like a sportsman. Yeah, you know that kind of thing. It's 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 a different mm-hmm. thing than, than applied gaming. I'm not saying that they're not also applied gamers. Mm-hmm. Stuff. I would say that. I would say that it can apply to both because. You also have professional and amateur in everything. You even have it in the arts. You have it in the sciences. You can have people who have an interest in something who are, you know, say, self-trained or they've gotten some basic training where they don't do it as a job. Yeah, you can I'm, still be an applied scientist without being I'm saying, a scientist. I, I'm, for I'm not saying that they're not. I'm yeah. just saying that I disagree with that being the the other extreme. Oh, I, think, I, I think, think the other extreme that we're is, looking is for... Is the devotee. So, so an, an example well, no. the super extreme. Well, no, because I feel like the super fan, the guy who spends hundreds of hours playing lots of different types of games per week... He's going to naturally pick up some things about game design, yeah, exactly. just by playing games. Exactly. Because if he, you know, if he plays a lot of uh, JRPGs but doesn't like a lot of Western RPGs, well, he's already learned enough about Western RPGs that he doesn't like. Oh, them. so you're saying that just by playing a lot of games, you're you're gaining some of that theoretical. Yeah, you're gaining some academic and so, knowledge and then, just by it's playing a lot of. Them. And this brings up the point that you nobody, do have to be widely studied though, because you right. do have to play a lot of different types of games, and nobody's going to be purely one thing or the other. There, there's going to be that this crossover. Yeah, of, I agree with. You know, to be a good applied anything, you have to be good theoretical anything, and vice versa. I think the opposite extreme that we're looking for is just the, the gamer who plays like, you know, buys every Madden game every go, year. Go ahead and say it. Or the or go the ahead gamer. And say, it. say the word. The casuals. <laughs> I don't want all the hate mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send the hate mail. Let's today. spread it around. <laughs> no, but I, I I agree with you. Actually, but no, I, there's nothing you've wrong with you've being made a good point. Gamer. No, no. I, but but I, yeah, you've made a good point. Yeah. yeah. If you only play Madden and Call of Duty, the, you know, I'll pick the low hanging fruit. Uh, you're you're not going to have any sort of academic knowledge about or, game design. Or, you're just going to play these games, or like that's bejeweled. Fine. You play yeah. like bejeweled, or sure, you play yeah. like some some. You play Angry Birds on your phone, yeah, and that's it. Or like you, you got a Wii and you play Wii Sports yes. for Christmas, or uh-huh. you got a Wii for Christmas and you play Wii Sports. But well, you, what you said about um, you know picking up stuff as you play mm-hmm. that's exactly the, the the piece of sand that I used to try to grow the pearl around whenever I caught, taught game design because yeah. I had I had you know basically sophomores coming in they were like I played a hundred thousand games and I, I I've done a million hours and I'm gonna be a game designer and I'm like mm, okay uh, we're gonna start with what you know which is the patterns and then I'm gonna teach you stuff like uh, you know Bartles uh, framework for actually writing a game design document, which is hundreds of pages long, and then their eyes just kind of go wide, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Writing? I'm not writing. I'm, I'm making games." Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, there's a disconnect here, and we got to build. It's like that, that commercial. Vocabulary. Like we, we have to, we have to tweak the balance on level three or yeah. whatever. It was. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tighten up those graphics. Yeah. 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 No, tighten up it's, the graphics. <laughs> it, it's like the. Um, I'm a tester. I'm a game designer. Uh, no, <laughs> no. That'd be like saying somebody in QA had a real job. <laughs> I'm not technically in QA. No. I, I oh, well. But um, I guess I am technically officially still. Um, no, but I kind of have to go back to film and use that as, as an example sure. where people that have watched a lot of films, they, they do pick up certain certain things about about film. But once they, they start to study film, is they understand what to look for right. in a movie. And that's what 
studying games helps you do is you know what to look for in a game and you know what to, and you have a deeper understanding of it when you play it. Right. But that's the key element. You still have to play it. You still have to play. You, you can, you can learn all of, all of these, these different concepts, but unless you then play the game and then apply that, that understanding as you play and then go, Oh, okay. I, I see what they're doing here because of my study. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, know, I think the same kind of applies in reverse too. That you kind of have to get a little bit of that formal training to an extent, even if it's not like you're going to a school for it. But you're you're hearing from people who understand it at right. least, uh-huh. who can tell you, like you know, take you from that level of just playing games and getting what you maybe like in games or how mm-hmm. good you are at games, but then teaching you enough about design that you can start to know what to look for. And, and there's yeah. so much to read too. It's 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 the same with anything. It's like um, nowadays, rather, um, there's so much to read on the internet, and there's of course so many textbooks out there as well. So there certainly you can get this information without a formal education per se. Sure. But of course the formal education will um, arguably speed up the process right. because you do have more hands-on instruction. You do have someone that will actually, first of all, hold you to it. It goes back to the dedication that you talked about. What did you, what did he call it? Work ethic or something along those lines where as one of the three, you still have to actually put, put in the work to actually, get anywhere you can't just have the natural talent right yeah you know and the skill you have to actually put in the work at some point task commitment task commitment thank you and i'll tell you what helps with task commitment is when you're in a class and if you don't have task commitment uh you could fail that class well and that's what the model was created to to show actually when renzulli did it uh i know that what you're saying is right because whenever i play games or read Tolkien, mm-hmm. or whatever it is, play a board game, anything, I have a really hard time shutting off the designer. Yeah, I have a really hard time shutting off the writer. Um, I mean, I will, I will edit poor uh, Tallers as I'm reading him and being like, why'd you use that sentence? You should use that sentence. Mm-hmm. And, and I just can't turn it off. You know, it, it's, like, it's like whenever I was 12 and I could just enjoy fiction, that part of me is just dead. It's dead. <laughs> I, I, I hate myself a lot of times when I'm watching movies because I do the same thing. Yeah, it's like, I oh, can't. why did you do it that way? You should have done that. Like, you should have lifted that shot. Or, you know, if you've ever done graphic design, desktop publishing, anything like that, yeah. you start looking for yeah. every yeah. icon the bad is like turning. crap. <laughs> like, XKCD X- 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 said this. If you want to really... Like, if you hate somebody, teach them to notice bad, <laughs> bad turning. Bad turning. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Which is how close the letters are. Yeah. 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 And I, I think it's like, if I could compare it to, to use a metaphor here, but it's like pulling the curtain back and you see the man behind the curtain and right. you understand how, you know, he's the one, you understand, you understand he's the one pulling all the strings in the puppets or whatever in the puppet show, or he's the one controlling the lighting. You understand all this stuff now and you can't really not have that understanding anymore. You right. can't just because the curtain is, is now covering him up again. It doesn't matter. You know, he's there. And in some ways it can increase your appreciation for something. Cause you're like, Oh, it does. Not well, only is it like, this certainly. is awesome, but now I know everything that went into it. And that makes it even uh-huh. more awesome. That's very true. Yeah. That's a good point. But if it's especially when it, 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 storytelling is a big part of this too. Once you understand the conventions, um, it tends to make stories more predictable, Yeah, which is why it's, um, to me, so important to have something f- to experience something that's fresh yes. or understand some that comes from a writer that understands the convention so well that they know how to tell the story and still use those conventions in such a way that that it comes across as fresh and new. And now we have dovetailed right into our enfranchised and uh, <laughs> discussion from a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so actually, yes, that that is a good connection, and I think a, a pretty good place to uh, wrap it up. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I guess in conclusion. What would we say, what what do you think we mean, kind of generally speaking, when we say theoretical gamer versus applied gamer? And do we think that that means anything useful? I, I think one of, the th- one of the takeaways from this I think is important, and let me know if anyone disagrees, mm-hmm. but I think these are not um, mutually exclusive concepts. These, not are, not, not these yeah. are not two binaries that you're going to be one or the other. Mm-hmm. These are... You're going to have some of each, probably. Symbiotic. They're symbiotic. Yes. And how much, how much do you have of both? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that you can you can truly call yourself um, a gamer if you're nothing but theory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do firmly believe that. Um, but I also think that just like in the sciences, you kind of need both, you know, kind of the experimental and then the, the sort of like the practical everyday sort mm-hmm. who will be able to communicate with each other, make each other better. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have the practical experience telling the theoretical people, you know, kind of things they need to be reminded of or need to stay grounded in, or maybe even just things that they're sort of learning as they go. But then the theoretical people can sort of be thinking ahead or looking at what the practical people are doing in sort of a 
uh, a critical way, not like a, like, you know, being critical of, but, you know, critiquing, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, being able to sort of see tendencies and say like, well, what if we did this, that sort of thing. Um, and so, I mean, game designers need audience feedback. Yeah. Right. So. Um, but also, you know, you need sort of the, the visionary game designers to look at what we have and think of what can be. Yeah. I think every creative person creating something needs audience feedback, if yeah. you will, yeah. whether you're a writer or an artist or anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, it look, you've got four icons and you throw it out and you're like, which of these four do you like, guys? <laughs> I mean, that's that's just what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that the, the terms may have some... Um, usefulness, but I think that they may be less useful within the context of gaming than in other fields, mm-hmm. specifically because it is so interactive mm-hmm. by its nature that as an article or an ar- you know an artifact uh, of the aesthetic space, I think games need to be played. They demand to be played by those who are going to study them um, in the same way that we would need to read the primary source of a book if we were going to be a literature major. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I was an English major back in the day, and man, did I read. I read and read and read and read and read. And I didn't read textbooks about Shakespeare. I read everything he ever wrote. And you I, know, I read all of English literature. I mean, it was crazy. And I think that it's fair to be critical of a thing, like of, of the people surrounding a thing, for instance, to the extent that you can say, hey, I don't I don't like this, whatever. And this is very vague, I realize. I'm trying to, I'm trying to articulate this. You can say, for example, say, I don't like film. I don't like the culture surrounding film, even though I don't watch a lot of films. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's a different argument than saying, I don't like what these films do or how they're made or what the, I don't know if that's making sense. It is making sense. I, I, I do still want to say that I think you're, you're running the risk of people dismissing you all out of hand Mm -hmm. unless you have at least some experience with it. And again, I have to, I have to go back to the Trekkie thing. Mm -hmm. There are people that have never, have no experience with Star Trek Mm -hmm. don't watch any of it and will just mercilessly, you know, insult Mm -hmm. and, and put down Mm -hmm. and have this very negative view of Trekkies Uh and, and to do that without really understanding what it is that they like and, and, and trying to fathom why they like it. I yeah. used to, I mean, well, okay, I used to really hate the Doctor Who community and uh-huh. the fan community. Um, and I still kind of do, but after seeing the show, I don't like the show very much. Yeah. And I don't like the fan community very much. But at least I can understand more of why they are the way they are. And I can, you know, I at least under, have some understanding of where they're coming from. So right? I, I guess what yeah. I was trying to say is that you can make arguments like that from the outside looking in, um, or not even looking in too far, just looking at the surface. But with the understanding that you're making a general statement about the whole of society, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. you're saying as a, as a quote unquote expert of what it is to be alive, you don't like what you're seeing from this group. Right, community, right. But, but you can't, you can't claim to be an expert on what it is that they're actually doing the right, inside. Right. right. But also if you're going to do that, if you're going to say, you know, look at, look at gamers and, and judge gamers or judge trekkies or whatever, mm-hmm. not only do you have to have at least look a little bit at what they're doing, mm-hmm. You should actually talk to them, yeah, personally, oh, for sure. and yeah, get an yeah. understanding, and not yeah, just yeah. look at them from afar. And this applies to everything, right. not just gaming. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, so not only should we contemplate, but we should also enjoy. Yes. It, I mean, it gets to the point where you know, if you're judging groups of people before talking to them, mm-hmm. I mean, this mm-hmm. is basic human knowledge. Just yeah. like you know, don't judge people without meeting them and first. Like right. you, you can do <laughs> it. People just, based, yeah, you're, you're just going to be doing it from a position of ignorance yes. and can't yeah. be taken seriously. Right. Don't judge people based on what uh, someone else tells you about them. You know, go talk to that person. Go talk to people in the community and actually try to verify. That, that what was said is true, or and then you can you can come out and be not. like, hey, like I still don't like this. In right. fact, talking to these people convinces me even more. Of course, but give them that chance, right? And that's why video games tell us everything we need to know about religion. <laughs> because not <laughs> only should we yeah. contemplate religion, we should enjoy it, experience it in order to be able to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, see what I did there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Are we done? I think think that's a wrap. Even if we're not done, we're definitely finished. (laughs) That got strangely deep. Yes. (laughs) Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for uh, episode number 74 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. I'm Nick. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook. 
Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.